Greetings, and thank you for visiting Podcast Stories. The majority of the time, Paul and Lynn would enter and exit their home through either the side entrance that led into the garage or the sliding glass doors that led out onto the patio. The front door of their home was extremely little used. The formal living room was located to the right of the foyer. Additionally, it was the room in the home that was used the least and was kept in immaculate condition. There was a corridor that connected to three bedrooms, including a big master suite and a guest bathroom, and it was located at the end of the entryway, on the left side. The enormous drapes in the formal living room were drawn, so the space was completely dark. The walnut coffee table was the focal point of the room, which featured a huge wingback chair on either side of a large white camel-backed couch that was positioned against the rear wall. In the early morning hours of that day, Paul was seated in the wingback chair that faced away from the archway that separated the living room and the entryway. Prior to that day, none of this had any relevance. He had sat there on numerous occasions when his wife was absent, pondering his life and imagining various possibilities, attempting to compute the probable losses he would incur if he had the courage to terminate his miserable marriage. This house would be gone, he would undoubtedly be pinched for alimony payments for years, half of his net worth would evaporate in a flash along with legal bills, and the friends they had and had in common would decide for themselves whether they wanted to stay his or hers forever. At the end of the day, he would still have to deal with Lynn, who was extremely harsh in her treatment of him. In the midst of his reflections, he became aware of the fact that she had returned home from going food shopping when he heard the door to the side open. It was at that moment that he ought to have gotten up and pretended that he had been in their bedroom. In the event that she discovered him in the living room, there would be any number of disagreements. Unwarranted criticism of Paul for petty transgressions, for some made-up cause, or for nothing at all was the subject of every single one of the arguments that occurred in this family. Lynn was the one who started each and every one of these arguments, and they were all started by her. He was aware that she had done it for the purpose of throwing him off balance and not for any other reason. It was possible for Lynn to engage in a heated debate for several weeks over the smallest of issues, and in the end, Paul would always find a way to appease her to the point where she would stop the dispute. It was his opinion that if there was constant friction in life, then life was just not worth living. It is preferable to resolve a conflict as quickly as feasible. The issue was that she always started the following one in a relatively short amount of time, which was the difficulty. This position was hopeless after they had been married for ten years, and he could not see any way out of it other than either losing his life or getting a divorce. Nevertheless, he persisted in making an effort to improve the situation, more for the purpose of preserving his own sanity in these modern times rather than to make things more pleasant for his wife. When Paul heard the door of the freezer close, he knew that she had put away the food that had been frozen. This was something that she did on a regular basis, she would send him out to collect the remaining items in a few of minutes, she did this kind of thing repeatedly. During the time that he was carrying out the action, he was not only required to comply with her command, but also to be able to accept her criticism. No, I want the cereal in the other cabinet this time, she would respond. It's not going to happen. Keeping his distance from her for as long as possible, he did not move from his position. In the worst case scenario, he waited for her to whistle for him or shout his name. It was nearly too much for him to handle at this point in time to hear the whistle. Just like a dog, he realized in his mind. Rather than hearing her voice, he heard the sound of light footsteps coming from the direction of the entrance. He would have seen her halting at the tiled floor of the entryway and looking down the hallway to make sure she was by herself if he had looked. He did not make any noise. When Lynn was thinking about it, she was thinking, I should have called him in the car. In spite of this, it was difficult for me to drive in converse before I reached home. In any case, I am secure in this location. It is likely that Paul is currently working on the gazebo in the backyard like a responsible spouse. As she phoned a number on her mobile phone, he heard the chirp of her phone not more than a few seconds later. Currently, she was in the entryway, and she was only five feet away from the back of the chair where he was sitting. When she calls him at this time, she asks, Hi Daddy, are you able to talk now, Daddy? We good for Thursday afternoon? I'll call him at work after one o'clock, he should be back from lunch by then. If he's at his desk, we'll be fine for a few hours. I'll open the back gate like always and see you about two. While she remained silent, the other party responded, Sure, Daddy. You can put that thing anywhere you like. You know I love your big old tool. I've got to go and find out where my boy is now. See you Thursday. He heard the flip phone snap shut and her footsteps trail off across the carpet to the sliding glass door. 
he was able to see her again on Thursday. The gazebo project that he had been working on in the backyard was attracted to her whistle and she called out to him. It would appear that she was oblivious to his difficult breathing as well as the grinding sound that was produced by the blood pouring through his heart and head. Paul was not in a tense position for the first time, and he had automatic answers that he had established from his experiences in the army and other places. First thing, don't panic unless you are discovered and actively under attack. Use your knowledge to your advantage and choose your own time to engage. Make your face blank, control your breathing, maintain be normal. Paul took a step forward and entered the den. As he made his way across the den toward the kitchen and the side door, he made an effort to avoid looking at her. I'm here. I was in the bathroom. I've got to run to the hardware store and get parts for the gazebo, he replied. The fact that he had been able to get those words out of his mouth was extremely impressive to him. That he did not put his hands around her throat at this very minute was another thing that he found astonishing. As he walked past her, she turned her head to look at him and captured the redness that was on his face. You need to wear a hat out there, you look like you're really getting sunburned. I don't want to look at your skin peeling off in a couple of days. By the way, there are groceries to bring in, do that before you go anywhere and don't be gone all day. She dropped her phone into her purse, which was on the kitchen counter, and headed out the back door to inspect Paul's work on the gazebo. In the event that he returned, there would be comments over it waiting for him, that was Lynn in every sense of the word. The majority of the things that she communicated to him consisted of a series of directives and either an implicit or explicit negative comment. Paul took her phone out of her purse and proceeded to search up the most recent number that she had dialed as she entered the backyard. After swiftly committing it to memory, he returned her phone to the purse she was carrying. This was followed by Paul bringing in the goods, putting them away, and then driving away in his compact pickup truck. However, rather of going to the hardware store, he made a stop at a park in the neighborhood that was located a couple of blocks away. The brief conversation that he had just overheard was repeated over and over again for the first 15 minutes of the meeting. To ensure that he could commit each and every word to memory, he desired to practice it in his head. Certainly, he took notes, there was not the slightest bit of uncertainty about what it meant, and there was no space for error. His wife was having an affair, and she was doing it in his home, most likely in his bed while he was at work. He was not aware of this information. At the same time that he was working to support her while she cheated on him, he was upset because he knew that he was supporting her infidelity. So, who was that guy? The individual whom she referred to as Daddy. Due to the fact that the area code was local and her parents lived in California, which is a thousand miles away, it was not her biological father. During the early stages of their marriage, she would occasionally refer to Paul as Daddy when they were engaging in sexual activity. It had been a very long time since she had stopped doing it, but he recalled it since he had found it to be some strange behavior. In the beginning, he had the impression that she was trying to tell him that she desired to have children and that she desired for him to be a father. Nevertheless, she appeared to be relieved when, after a couple of years of marriage, they made the decision that they would not have children. The fact is that she was undeniably a daddy's daughter. After then, he contemplated the practical aspects of the situation in order to ascertain the most effective way for him to proceed. Thursday was the day that she was going to let her lover in through the back gate. The fact that he was strolling down the alley was indicated by this. It would be possible for him to ambush him there, however, what would he do with his unethical wife? It was necessary for her lover's car to be located in close proximity if he was walking. After a while, he realized that her lover would most likely leave his car just here in the park. Can you tell me who this individual is, and how he could possibly find out? It would be the most logical thing to do to call the number that he obtained from her mobile phone. It is possible for him to have another person call it as if it were a mistake and then attempt to persuade him to reveal his identity. Those who are most likely to obtain that information are women. Who was it that he knew would be the one to make the call? Who else might be aware of this information? The response was straightforward. Sue was Lynn's closest friend, and he believed that if Sue was unaware of it, then no one else would be willing to inform him either. It's possible that Lynn's sister would know, but it was quite unlikely. Ever since she was shunned by the rest of the family due to the ugly divorce she had gone through, she and Lynn had not been particularly close individuals. Are you able to ask Sue? As long as Lynn had known her, he had known her as well, and Sue had been his buddy from the beginning. However, it is possible for women to be more loyal to one another than they are to their spouses at times. 
Nick, Sue's husband, was 15 years her senior, and the two of them appeared to be the most loving couple in the entire world. Sue was married to Nick. He had the impression that Sue would reveal virtually anything to Nick. Would she, on the other hand, tell him about Lynn? As a friend, he considered Nick to be. He would have believed that Nick would have informed him if he had known about something like this, despite the fact that they were not very close friends. Nick was a good-natured individual. Paul made the decision to give Nick a shot. Nick, who was in a semi-retired state at the time, volunteered his time on Saturdays to serve as a sort of goodwill ambassador for the golf course. In exchange, he was given a free round of golf during the week when the course was not at capacity. This required him to make a trip to the golf course. On the drive there, he meticulously plotted out his approach to the destination. He was unable to simply utter it out loud. Imagine for a moment that Sue and Lynn were both informed of the news. It was necessary for him to exercise caution. While they were riding in a golf cart to check on the conditions at the seventh hole, Paul offered Nick a hypothetical question. Nick, I have a hypothetical question for you, Paul remarked. If you were to have a confidential conversation with someone, would you feel obliged to keep it confidential or would you share it with Sue? A strange look crossed Nick's face before he continued driving for a few yards. Are you asking me to keep a secret from Sue? I guess I'm wondering if and Sue always discuss what you learn from other people, even if you hear it in confidence, it's just a hypothetical. Nick pulled over into the grass, and he turned to stare squarely at Paul, almost expecting him to tell him something. I was wondering if you had a particular question for me. In the event that you do, feel free to ask me anything, he continued, maintaining the same peculiar and concentrated expression on his face. If I do ask a question, would you be able to keep this talk confidential? What I will guarantee is that I will never bring it up without being asked to do so. However, I will not lie to Sue if she asks me about it. I conduct myself in this manner, Paul. A secret is something I am able to keep, but I will never lie to my wife or to a friend. Nick was obviously aware of something, and Paul had the one to share it with him. He gathered his composure and asked, Nick, do you have any information about an affair that my wife might be having? Could be having, in a technical sense. Permit me to restate the question, do you have any information regarding an affair that Lynn is currently having or has had in the past? It was the previous New Year's at the Holden's party, Nick said, and it came pouring out of him like a dam bursting. Everyone had gathered outside, and they were about to begin the fireworks display that they had planned. The champagne had caused Sue to become ill, and you are aware that she does not drink very often. In order to use the restroom, she went upstairs. On the landing, she heard someone trying to turn the doorknob while she was in the bathroom, where she was experiencing some nausea. After she had finished her shower and exited the restroom, she became aware of sounds emanating from the direction of the hallway, which had a turn that led to a few bedrooms. Due to her concern that another individual might be ill, she went down to the location in question and checked around. At the end of the corridor, where Lynn was leaning against the wall, there was a substantial individual who, to be honest, there is no appropriate way to put it. In order to secure her, he positioned her against the wall and wrapped her legs around his waist. When Lynn noticed Sue standing there, she grinned and gave a small wave away, as if to say, get the hell out of here. She then told me about it when she was driving home. It is common knowledge that Sue and Lynn had been friends for a long time, and she desired to have a conversation with Lynn before we made any decisions. I mentioned that we ought to inform you presently. The end result was that she had a conversation with your wife, who informed her that the incident had been a one-time occurrence due to the presence of alcohol and a disagreement with you, in addition to the very aggressive actions of the guy, whose name is Buddy White. He has a well-known reputation for being a bully, and Sue is aware of this fact. His wife is a lawyer, and he married for financial gain. In light of the fact that we did not wish to ruin your marriage over a single occurrence, Sue requested that I keep all of this to myself. On the other hand, I explained to her that I would not lie to you if you ever asked me directly about it. Over the course of the previous five months, it has been poking a hole in my heart. Even though I'm relieved that it's finally out, I'm so sorry for you, man. It's not over yet, Lynn lied to Sue about it. At this point, she may have been carrying on with this person, or perhaps she has moved on to another guy. It was an hour ago when I overheard her chatting to him on the phone. If I had known, I would have come to you, for the love of God and man. My deepest apologies, Paul. Let's go find out what Sue has to say by going back to my place, she said. They drove away from the golf course in their individual automobiles and headed in the direction of Sue and Nick's house. 
perhaps she is aware of something else altogether. He broke the news to his wife, and she sat down, crying. She had so hoped things would work out for Paul and Lynn. She would do anything to help if she could. When she heard that the affair was continuing, her demeanor changed. Sue felt a bit of Lynn's betrayal herself. Now she had been assured that the affair was finished and had based her action, or lack thereof, on that lie. Sue, there is absolutely one thing that you could do for me. After checking Lynn's phone, I was able to obtain the number that she had called. In order to learn his name, would you phone him and claim that the number you are calling is incorrect? I want to make sure that she is seeing someone right now. Sue worked from home as an editor. She had a doctorate in English literature and a background in theater. She planned the call by employing her best acting technique and social engineering skills. She would use her flawless English accent, which never failed to impress. She dialed the number with the phone set to speaker. Sue blinking, I'm sorry, this is Buddy White, she said. I apologize for the mistake. As she spoke, her entire scenario was thrown out the window. Well, that was certainly not satisfying, she added. But the information was clear, Lynn had not broken off the affair with White. To add one more piece of information to the mix. They talked for a while about what to do next. Paul was adamant that he was going to catch the pair in the act, and it was going to be at their next encounter on Thursday. But he wanted more ammunition. He wanted to be prepared with as many facts as he could when he confronted his wife. That way, he could catch her not only in infidelity but in all of her lies that she would undoubtedly try to cover things up with. It is not possible for me to employ a private investigator to follow her around. There is a possibility that she will not even meet or communicate with White before Thursday, and I would not know who to call. In addition, I anticipate a significant amount of costs associated with the divorce and everything else. I am in need of a speedy method to get the goods against her. For at least a minute, they were silent and engaged in deep thought. Could it be that there was a snitch, and Sue inquired. Are you a mole? What would happen if a friend of hers, let's say her best buddy, were to take advantage of her by telling her a story? Would you make such a move? Gentlemen, you should never underestimate a woman who is angry. My patience with her and the way she has handled all of us has run out. I have a feeling that I will be able to devise a narrative that will convince her to hand it over to me. They planned that Sue would call Lynn and tell her that she was in desperate need of assistance. They would then make plans to meet for coffee on Sunday morning. Nick would modify an old purse that Sue had to hold a video camera, and Sue would place the camera on the table to record every word and facial expression. By noon on Sunday, they should have a lot more information. I need to have a conversation with you as soon as possible, Lynn. Should we get together for a cup of coffee in the morning? I am in a predicament, and you are the only person I know who has the experience to assist me, and I must say that I have complete faith in you. How are you doing, Sue? Could you be sick? How is Nick doing? Lynn, that is not the case at all. Do you remember the last New Year's Eve party? When it comes to my situation, it's kind of like that. I get what you mean. It's possible that I can solve that problem for you. What about 10 o'clock at that brand new coffee shop in the shopping center? Let's discuss in a good, peaceful place, if you like. I'll see you there, I said. Secretly, Sue was smiling. It's about time her old friend came out of her shell. She had been with that old bugger of a husband for years, and she could do a lot better. She was still cute. It would be hot to have someone to share stories with like she used to do with her sister. She would love to help her friend shed her outdated ideas. In time, she could teach Sue everything her sister, and more importantly, her daddy, had taught her about life. Sue arrived at the coffee shop early and chose a table outside under an awning. She then proceeded to carefully place her purse on the table and test out the camera inside. She moved two chairs away from the table so that there was only one place for Lynn to sit. She adjusted the angle of the camera and performed some audio testing. Since the air was calm, there should not have been any wind noise. She set it up so that she only needed to reach in and click one button to start recording. The 16 gigabytes card had the capacity to store a great deal of video. Nick had skillfully positioned the camera and the purse using Velcro straps to hold it firmly in place. He had also camouflaged the holes for the lens and the microphone so that they appeared to be part of the pattern on the black purse. By the time Lynn showed up, she was prepared. Would you be able to fetch us some coffee, Lynn, and I'll be sure to hold our place? Right here is the most secluded location. Return in a moment. 
As soon as Lynn arrived from the shop with the drinks, Sue pressed the button, and she quickly checked to make sure that she was recording. They quickly got the preliminary matters out of the way, and Sue began her story. I don't know what to do, Lynn, because there's this guy who wants me, and he wants me. Despite the fact that Nick hasn't made love to me in such a long time, he is so adorable. Nick has complete faith in me, I have never cheated on him, but I am completely tempted to do so right now. It is because I am interested in knowing how you are feeling after the New Year's celebration that I am asking you this question. If I go ahead and do this, would I come to regret it? Go for it, you woman. If I'm being completely honest, I don't figure out why you haven't done this before. It's true that Nick is a great person, but honey, he's way ahead of his time. You are still fairly young and adorable. Even though I've always liked your appearance, I've never been able to comprehend why you choose to spend your time with Nick. Wow, you don't have any regret then. On this matter, it seems as though you have everything under control. Honey, was that party really simply a one-time event that you attended? If I had not told you that back then, you might have let the cat out of the bag. I won't lie to you now, I had to tell you that back then. However, now that you are in a circumstance that is comparable to mine, we are able to exchange all of this information. To tell you the truth, Lynn, we are going to have some hot conversations. Give me every detail about it. What a wonderful thing this is. Considering that I am currently considering doing it myself, I am curious as to where it all began with you and Buddy. Are you two following through with it? It would be nice to see the expression on your face. I'm willing to bet that you will be wet in a few minutes if you aren't already wet right now. Alright, let me tell you the story about Buddy. When we first met, it was at the Halloween party hosted by the Holdens, which was two months earlier. Remember that I was wearing the outfit with the leopard print? During the first hour or so, Buddy kept looking at me, and I did the same thing. When his wife was helping with the trick-or-treaters at the front door, and Paul was out back by the fire, I continued to look at him. I was standing next to Buddy when he approached me and whispered that we should meet on the landing in five minutes. I simply gave him a slight nod of my head. You are aware of how large and packed the party was, and the capacity of the house is enormous. It was not difficult to make the journey back down the dimly lit corridor and ascend to the landing. Because all of the activity was taking on downstairs, nobody was present. After I had climbed to the landing, Buddy gave me a passionate kiss and then took me into the bathroom, where he had closed the door behind me. Within two seconds, I was able to remove my leotard, and he proceeded to screw me while I was seated on his lap on the toilet. In the case of Sue, he is enormous, and he gets what he wants. When it comes to him, I appreciate that. It's not true, I adore you. There is no romantic nonsense at all. Now that he has screwed the heck out of me, I am coming at him like a raging bull. There was a good chance that we did it twenty times between that time and New Year's. During that particular evening, we were attempting to recreate the Halloween experience, but you were in the restroom, so we had to go down the corridor instead. Although I would have locked him in one of those bedrooms, the Holdens kept the doors secured. I would have screwed him in. You mean to tell me that it didn't finish there? You're still going to screw him over? That's exactly right, honey. What a blow he is to me. The truth of the matter is that I will be screwing him in my own bed the following week. That is absolutely insane. But where does Paul stand? Sue, don't you, at least a little bit, feel sorry for him? Mr. Paul is a married man. Both a lover and a husband serve completely different functions, so it is impossible to treat them in the same manner. When I ask Paul to do something, he is there to do it. When you need some good sex, Buddy is there for you. I am not claiming that I never like having sexual encounters with Paul. Hell, after a satisfying session with Buddy, I enjoy having sex with Paul as a way to wind down and relax. Sue, I would want to share my thoughts on Paul with you. I believe that he was an excellent choice for a husband because I already knew that he would always be a decent provider. One thing that is great is that he did not push on having children. I am able to dominate him like a television remote control since he is a good listener and he trusts me. All that is required of me is to act as though I am envious or to occasionally knock him off balance by engaging in a heated fight. You know, when he comes home, I will occasionally sniff him as if I'm hunting for perfume on him. I do this without even realizing it. I do it to give him the impression that I will never cheat on him and to throw him off the scent of the truth. I make it a point to go on and on about how bad I think it is that the husband has cheated on me, and how I would never allow him cheating on me. This happens if there's a movie on and the husband has also cheated. 
due to the fact that Paul is so submissive, having him around is like having a little gay friend. It doesn't matter how I treat him, he always comes back for more. I can treat him however I like. Every once in a while, he is allowed to have some free sex, and I am allowed as much freedom as I can handle. As far as I am concerned, I am free to come and go as I like, but, he must first check out his every move with me. I am always aware of his location, so I never have to be concerned about him discovering me in the company of another person. So you've been attracted to other people, Susie? To be honest, I'm not even sure if I can count all of them. First, there was the year when we were married for the very first time. Just just inside the law. In the grocery store, he was staring at me despite the fact that I had just picked him up. Even my real name was never revealed to him. For a period of six months, I accompanied him to several hotel rooms until he became too possessive. Those young men are going to have to watch that. After that, I worked on a number of one-off projects. When I was younger, I had a friend who worked in sales and had a penchant for naughty things. On account of the fact that he only visited the city a few times a year, that was an excellent one. For a longer period of time than almost all of them, I have kept Buddy occupied. As I mentioned before, he is a hound with a whole splitting tool, and he is married to a woman who appears to be completely oblivious to the situation. While she is at work, he is messing around. Almost at any time, he is able to come see me, and I have complete control over that. So, please fill me in on your most recent victory. So, Sue, where did you first meet him? Lynn, I just can't get over how in control you are, Sue said as she ran through her prepared story about her fake paramour, Rod. The facts are not crucial, but her performance was excellent. She had Lynn believing every word she said and urging her to take full advantage of the situation. Sweetheart, I'm not sure if I'll be able to treat Nick the same way that you do Paul. When it comes to the animal kingdom, there are dominating individuals, and then there are the remainder of the pack. They are the ones who take commands, you are the one who gives them. The drones are there to provide assistance to the queen bee. In my relationship with Paul, I am the dominant dog, and I wouldn't have it any other way. As the Alpha is allowed to select her own mates, I am able to take use of this privilege because it is mine. It would have been possible for him to assume that position in the hierarchy if he had the motivation to do so, but he chose not to do so. He puts up a struggle every once in a while, but he will never be able to outlive me. Despite the fact that he despises fighting, I am not the least bit bothered by it. I have more stamina and I make it a point to win every time, no matter what the circumstances are. I'm the Alpha, and it's not hard for you to become the same. In my opinion, there is no issue with you being in charge of the show. At your age, Nick could never be able to take your place. The only thing you need to do is accept the job, and you will be free to do whatever you choose. Put together a strategy to begin screwing Rod, and make sure to savor every moment of it. Nick will continue to be there, and the more you mistreat him, the more he will conform to the inherent subservient position that he is destined to play. It is highly likely that you could manipulate Rod in front of Nick, and he would not hesitate to accept it. It is simply the way things operate in the world that we live in. You have always been in control, the only difference is that you have not yet taken advantage of it. One more thing, however, what about sexually transmitted diseases? Do you not feel concerned that you might catch something? To what extent do you typically make use of condoms? Because Buddy is so aggressive, I insist the guy put a rubber on with him. It's a different experience than the others. If you were to try to get one on a stallion, it would be very impossible, but he is clean. At one point, I was a little anxious since it was painful to urinate after the experience, but the doctor assured me that my vagina was simply inflamed from having rough sex. One of the things that she said was, tell your husband to be more careful. I couldn't help but laugh out loud at that. Gloria, there was a moment when I did, in fact, become infected with the virus. It was a terrible experience. I had to take an injection and some pills for a couple of weeks, and after that, I became more cautious. How did you manage to keep that from Paul? That was pretty daring of me. You know how he enjoys playing the guitar? Yeah, and he's pretty good as well. Whatever. Anyway, he told me that he was going to jam with his friend. He was expecting me to tell him no because I never let him leave the house by himself. I just looked at him with a deadpan expression and said, if you really feel that's what you should be doing. I didn't tell him that he could or couldn't, but I did give him the option to decide whether or not to go to the jam. He went to the jam. When he came back, wham, I nailed him with a running argument for two weeks while I took the antibiotics. 
If he hadn't gone, I could have turned that into an argument too. And I never have to say no to sex with him because he won't initiate sex if we're fighting. He can't just make up with me like a normal guy would. We have to be all lovey-dovey, or he doesn't initiate. At that point, the women had been talking for a long time, and Sue was antsy to get the recording back to Nick and Paul. So she thanked Lynn profusely and left for home. The conspirators sat there appalled as the video rolled. Sue and Nick could hardly recognize Lynn, because she was never so hard on Paul when there were other people around. Paul was shocked, but not nearly as much as the couple he had come to know that Lynn was. The one thing that we haven't discussed is Anita White, the speaker said. Dear Sue, do you have any information about her? Surely, she is aware that the Cretan is cheating on her. In the event that she is unaware of the fact that he is Lynn, I feel responsible to pass on the information to her. In the event that she does, however, she might be happy with it, and she might warn him off, which would ruin my sting. My sole interaction with her has been at a few different gatherings. Despite the fact that she puts on a brave face, it is clear that she is severely affected by the fact that her husband has a reputation for being a bully. I just want to know if she is completely intimidated by him. If you were to let her in on what you have planned, you would be taking a significant risk. It is possible that she will completely blow the whole thing, and then you will have nothing except this footage. On the other hand, if she were to collaborate, she might be able to assist in putting the Cretan out of commission. In the event that she receives a call from you, she will be aware that you are keeping an eye on them, and I might be able to assist her as well. I may simply have a conversation with her about his cheating in a general sense and get a sense of her to determine whether she is more likely to be on your side or his side. I have complete faith in you to manage Anita White because you did an excellent job with the video. The sooner I have that resolved, the better, because it will have an impact on my plans. Everyone, I want to express my gratitude for your assistance. You and your partner are completely out of it when I hear back about Mrs. White. I would like to include you in what is going to happen, and it is not in your best interest to know any further facts. You are not going to act in a foolish manner, are you, Paul? inquired Sue. Are you referring to the mindless activities that I have been engaging in for the past ten years? Paul did not immediately respond to her question, but he did say, No, I mean something violent. I'm going to handle this the only way I know how. I would appreciate it if you could all hold this information in the strictest confidence. When she calls, you just do not answer the phone. In this manner, you will have no control over the events that take place. I accept full responsibility for this. In the later hours of that day, Sue decided to take a chance and call Anita White. Anita, this is Sue Carter, she said. At the gatherings hosted by the Holdens, we have had a few conversations. It's me, Sue. I do not forget you. What is it that you require, Anita? Could you converse freely at this very moment? Does anyone else or your husband happen to be nearby? I have to make sure that this conversation is kept quiet. I am currently sitting here reading, and Buddy is currently out and about. What is it that I can do to assist you? Is there a legal issue at heart? Well, I suppose that's a possibility. To be honest with you, Anita, there is no appropriate method to bring up this topic, so I will simply say it. Although I am sorry to be the one to break the news to you, I must tell you that your friend is cheating on you. Not with me, but with someone else that I know. I am very sorry, but you have a right to know. First, there was complete stillness on the other end of the line, and then Sue heard sniffles and cries. That Cretan, she whispered, that was all over a year ago. It was his vow that he would finish with all of that. On the basis of his vow, I brought him back, and I warned him that if he went through with it again, I would let him go. After making her feel better, Sue proceeded to the next stage. What are your plans for dealing with this situation, Anita? I am aware that it is not my place to inquire but depending on the response you provide, I might be able to assist you in some manner. I am grateful to you, Sue, for your concern. In my opinion, he will never again sleep in my bed. I will tell you that. I have a prenuptial agreement set in stone, and I have threatened to use it in the event that I divorce him, particularly if there is substantial evidence that he has been unfaithful. It is impossible for him to get any money. Because he is unable to maintain employment, the only thing he is capable of doing is accompanying me to events and seducing ladies on the side. If he were to locate a vulnerable woman who would take him in, he would be living in the gutter till he found her there. Anita, 
I am able to provide you with the evidence that you require, however, you are required to guarantee that you will maintain your composure for a few days and not reveal to him that you are aware of something. What do you think about that? I assure you that I will be as calm as ice, and that he will not have any idea what is going on until I have the evidence in my possession. To bring you some preliminary evidence, would it be possible for me to send someone to your workplace tomorrow night? They decided to meet, and Sue called Paul the following morning at work to let him know that he was to meet her in her office at 1 o'clock on Monday the following day. Paul strolled into her office while holding the video camera in his hands. He introduced himself to her, and they shook hands before he sat down. Mrs. Dear White, I am the husband of the woman with whom your man is having sexual relations. The following is a portion of her own words. Paul set the camera on her desk, queued up to the relevant segment, and hit play. The small screen was hardly visible, but the audio was fantastic. When he noticed the tears in her eyes, Paul stepped around the desk and put his hand on her shoulder. I know how you must be feeling. All of this is new to me because I have just recently discovered about the behavior of my wife. However, I take it that you have been familiar with the nature of a friend for a considerable amount of time. Anita, I'm coming up with something, and I'd like to know whether you would be interested in participating in it. It is something that is going to take place regardless of what happens, so it is fine if you do not choose to take part in it. On the other hand, I wouldn't feel well if I didn't make the offer. For years, he has been a source of intimidation for me. It has been repeated by me numerous times. On numerous occasions, I have experienced bodily fear of him. At this point, I am finished with that. What I want to do is flip the script. Right now, I want him to be in pain. What are you planning, Paul? Does it involve any kind of violent action? There is a possibility that it will become messy. Despite the fact that I have no intention of killing anyone, I anticipate having to give your unfaithful spouse a good spanking. Do you find that to be a constraint? He is 6 feet 2 inches tall, and I am 5 feet 5 tall. He has never found me to be a suitable match. No harm intended, but I'm not sure you'd be able to defeat him in a battle that's fair. It won't be a fight that's fair. I'll take him to the cleaners straight away, she said with a slight smile and a nod. In that case, I'm in. That is the only thing, Paul. Make sure to leave a little amount for me to muck up as well. After his meeting with Anita White, Paul was in no mood for work. He was still stinging from the things Lynn had said about him on the video. Unfortunately, he recognized some truth in it, although he viewed things differently. He did hate fighting with Lynn, but he didn't view his conciliatory nature as a weakness. He could understand her perception of him as being a wimp. He chided himself that way many times. On the other hand, someone had to make an effort in this marriage to make life better, and Lynn certainly didn't. Maybe what hurt the most was her characterization of him as her little gay friend. Gay. He was not, and she would see him in all his macho male glory on Thursday. Maybe you should give her a taste of that before Thursday just to see how she would react. What would she do faced with a husband who wouldn't take no for an answer? Would that make her want him more? Not that he would ever take her back at this point, the trust was totally gone, and that was the basis of any relationship. But maybe it would give her something to think about on those long nights she would be facing alone on Tuesday and Wednesday. There wasn't much work being done in Paul's office on Tuesday and Wednesday. He spent a lot of time going over scenarios. There were too many variables, and he knew that line about the best laid plans. In the end, he worked out several possible ways it could go, as well as his preferred way. A lot of Thursday afternoon would have to be played by ear. He spent a few hours in the company gym getting his flexibility and strength honed for Thursday. It was easy to do the workouts as he envisioned what was about to happen. Things were tense at home. They only spoke when necessary. Normally, Lynn would have been on his case hard, but his behavior had been so over the top that she wanted to wait and see if this were just some aberration. She needed to figure out what was wrong and get Paul back under her thumb where he belonged. She found herself looking forward to Thursday even more. Maybe a good sex session with Buddy would give her some insight. Tuesday night, while Lynn was showering, Paul rifled through his dresser drawers looking for something his grandfather had given him. Paul had played with it as a child, and when he joined the army, it had been his present. Paul's father and grandfather had both been in the service, and Grandpa had fought the Nazis in France after Normandy. He had taken a set of brass knuckles off a German body as a war souvenir. Paul looked at it lying in his hand. It was a mean-looking piece of equipment, steel rather than brass, and possibly illegal to own. 
His grandfather had told him to be very careful with it, but that it might come in handy someday. That day had almost come. This was war. Lynn and her lover had not played fair, and neither would he. Paul forced himself to eat a hearty breakfast at work on Thursday morning. He would not be eating lunch, but he hoped his rival would. It would slow him down. Mostly, he paced the floor in his office going over details. He had deposit a few items in the guest bedroom that he hoped to be able to utilize. That would depend on whether Lynn waited for her lover in the backyard or merely opened the gate and went back inside. No matter, he could adapt. He fingered the set of knuckles sitting on his desk. He paced and thought some more, stoking his controlled anger. By one o'clock, he had changed into jeans, a t-shirt, and a stout pair of running shoes. He checked his pockets, cell phone, keys, knuckles, bifold. Before leaving, he phoned Lynn from his desk phone so that she would be able to check the number and know he was really at work. That would preempt her call to him. He was calm and not at all threatening on the phone. He told her he had meetings all afternoon and wouldn't be near his phone. His cell phone would be turned off too. He said he might be an hour or so late getting home. Lynn took it as a good sign that he was drifting back to his normal docility because he had called to check in. She relaxed a little with this knowledge, maybe she'd even give Paul a little reward with some cool down slash makeup sex this evening. She began to get ready to meet her lover. It took 20 minutes for the two of them to drive to the park, lover boy's car wasn't there yet. Anita dropped him off and he jogged down the street to his house and slipped into the backyard through the side gate on the end of the house away from the garage. He hid behind a fire bush and waited nervously, checking the time on his phone, which was muted at 1.45. Lynn appeared in the backyard dressed in a string bikini and headed to the back gate. She unlocked it and looked down the alley, apparently seeing nothing of interest. She closed the gate and moved to a lounge chair under the big pecan tree. This was Paul's signal. He had left the side gate ajar, and he slipped back through the opening and around to the front door. Opening the door with his key, he walked over the spot where his wife's party had been revealed a few days before. In the spare bedroom, he picked up a cordless drill and some hardware and walked into the master bedroom. In under a minute, he'd installed a hasp on the inside of the door and left the lock hanging on it. He placed a small piece of wood between the door edge and the jamb to prevent the door from closing just in case. There were a lot of things that could have gone wrong he could have forgotten to do something, Lynn could have unlocked the gate much earlier and waited in the bedroom for her lover, her lover could have arrived early, and he could have been caught in the process of his preparation. However, none of these things occurred. Instead, he did some breath control and waited for the final assault, which he planned and carried out on his own terms. Paul was standing, looking through the slightly open door to the guest bedroom, and he was holding the video camera in his right hand. In this dark hallway, the video quality would not be very good but he was confident that the audio would be. He heard the sliding glass door moving and voices. Lynn was giggling and a male voice was growling. He could picture the big man with his hands groping her as they passed the guest bedroom. Paul could see that his wife's bikini top was already gone. They moved into the master bedroom, kissing and fondling, not attempting to close the door. Paul followed, his heart pounding, the short distance down the hallway, still recording. At the door, he knelt and peeked. Buddy had his wife in a bear hug. Lynn had her eyes closed and was working the buttons on his shirt carefully. Paul set the video camera on the dresser just inside the door. He could see from the screen that it was pointed directly at the bed and the pair who were now falling into it. This would be the hardest waiting. He wanted to get the actual act recorded. No denials possible, no doubt whatsoever. He was desperate to release his rage. He scooted back out the door and stood so that his legs would be ready for the challenge. He tried to limit the number of times he peeked, not wanting to alert them with movement. For a full five minutes, the couple stroked and caressed, both of them now naked. They would not be in a hurry today since they had all afternoon to defile his marriage. But soon passion would overtake them. As Paul stood outside the door, he overheard them conversing. Lynn referred to him as daddy on multiple occasions, which confirmed his assumptions that she was struggling with her relationship with her father. God, I can't wait to drill you, baby, Buddy's voice said. It seems like a year and it's only been a week. Paul peeked again and saw the bastard on his knees between Lynn's raised legs, lining up himself. Then he saw him plunge and heard his wife scream in a way he never had before. They began moving together, uttering curses and unintelligible sounds. He'd seen enough. 
he touched the brass knuckles once more for luck and walked quietly to the bed. Lin caught his movement just before he shoved the bigger man in the ribs as hard as he could, knocking him out of her hole and onto his side. Your dickhead needs to get out of my wife, he screamed. Buddy's shocked face took in the situation, it was her husband, obviously not a very big guy. He instantly reverted to type, and his type was bully. He began to move off the other side of the bed, intending to deal with this annoyance. Paul stepped back a few paces as Buddy rounded the far corner of the bed and headed his way. Buddy mistook this move as a retreat. Lynn was now up on her knees, clutching the covers and screaming, Get the hell out of here. Try not to injure him. Which man was she talked to Paul, rocked back on his trailing foot, took a running step, and launched himself into Buddy's chest, bringing the brass knuckles as hard as he could into the solar plexus. They crashed onto the floor with Paul's full weight, collapsing the bastard's chest. When you can't breathe, all other considerations become moot, Buddy pushed, trying to get Paul off his chest. He made a high-pitched whining noise, unable to draw breath. Panic was in his eyes. Paul sat up, straddling his opponent, and Buddy's hands pressed on the floor, trying to get in a better position to take an air. Paul then delivered the coup de grace, bringing his right hand high over his head. He brought the steel on his fist directly down on the center of Buddy's terrified face with as much force as he had. There was nowhere for the man's head to recoil and soften the blow. He heard Bones give a satisfying crunch and watched blood start to pour out of his ruined face. Buddy's attempts to breathe were further hindered now by the blood flowing into his mouth and throat, and he was totally incapacitated. Paul stood up and made his way toward the entrance, content with this initial appearance. He had been ignoring Lin's shrieking, but now he heard her words, What the hell are you doing? How insane are you? Come back to this place and assist him. He realized that she thought he was leaving, running away. That was according to plan, a little psychological warfare. He kicked the small piece of wood away from the jam and closed the door. He locked the hasp in place and turned to face his wife. Her look turned from angry to frantic as she realized they were all locked in. She was naked and had no protection from this crazy version of her husband. Her tone changed instantly, Paul, oh Paul, I know it looks bad, but he forced me into this. This person is a bully, he threatened to hurt not just me but also you. To get his hands on me, he threatened to kill you. Even though I didn't want to, I had no choice but to do it. With no expression on his face, he had been steadily approaching the bed as she continued to tell her lies. Shut up, you lying, he exclaimed. I know you've been him for months, Paul turned his attention back to the victim on the floor. He was gurgling, still gasping for air and turning a little blue. Paul wanted him hurt, not dead. He pulled his legs so that he was positioned close to the iron bedstead. He put him on his side so the blood could drain. Reaching into his top dresser drawer, he brought out five pairs of handcuffs. He secured Buddy's ankles and wrists to the bedstead with four of them. Returning to his wife, who was lying on her back, he removed her legs from the bed, drew her arms behind her back, and then cuffed them. After standing up, he jerked her by her shoulders to a vertical position and quickly marched her into the bathroom, where he placed her on the toilet. Please, Polly, don't hurt me again, he pleaded, while he was speaking, Paul rubbed the brass knuckles on his right fist, making sure that she saw them. I want the whole story, how you met, why you screwed him, and why you thought it was okay to screw me over, he said. This is the part where you spill your guts. In addition to that, I am curious about the other men that you have been swindling over the course of the past ten years. Considering that you won't be spinning at the concept of screwing the bastard after all, we have the entire afternoon at our disposal. Paul, I never wanted this to happen, Lynn said to herself as she took a measured decision. It was evident that he knew some things about her actions. How much did he know? Were there areas in which she could fudge to make her adultery appear less treacherous? Did she dare to lie to him? She decided that she needed to test the waters and proceed gently. He's a really aggressive individual, and he's a very huge guy. While I was at a party, he approached me and enticed me to come upstairs to the Holton. Sue sighed and said, I had no idea he was going to take advantage of me, but there was nobody around to help me. She went on to say that she could tell you that he had me cornered. In addition, what kind of party was that? asked Paul, fishing for more lies. Lynn calculated, it must have been Sue or Nick that told on her. Sue had only witnessed the New Year's party. It was the New Year's party, liar. If you had banged him twenty times or more by the time New Year's rolled around, it was Halloween. Who was it that told? 
you'd be surprised how many people do, she wailed. It's the truth. Do you believe that the lover boy has not told you? Perhaps it was one of them, but it is irrelevant to the discussion. Sue has informed you that I will rip her eyes out, but I am aware of something about her that would destroy her marriage, and I will make sure that I use it. It sounds like you're referring to her new lover, Rod, right? It's true that we are all aware of him. The reason we made him up is for your pleasure. I actually came up with the name, and I considered calling him Dick or Lance. That got you talking, and Sue recorded the entire thing. It's been copied onto a bunch of DVDs, and I'm just about ready to send them out whenever I feel like it. Let's see, there's your daddy, your mom, and that brother you despise. Lynn cringed, actually, Sue wasn't the one who told me what was going on initially, and Sue didn't tell me any details. She believed that New Year's was the first and last time you spent with him. After that, you graciously dumped your entire whoring history onto that video. And as for who tipped me off in the first place, well, sweetie, do you remember a phone call you made to Loverboy last Saturday in our entryway? You said something about how much you love his big old tool. That's right, baby, you tipped me off, you told me everything I know about your whoring. You know what? I don't think I need any more information, I pretty much know all I can stand to know. And you've just proven you can't tell the truth anyway. You will be served with papers in a couple of days. The only thing that is left to do is to dispose of the two of you. I will need to consult with an attorney about that. Paul pulled out his cell phone and dialed a number. If there's anything else that you want to say, you can say it to my lawyer. Is it possible for you, Anita, to come in right now and collect the garbage? He listened to her and laughed before closing the phone and grasping her shoulders once more. He then marched her back into the bedroom and showed her the sad situation of her partner, which included him being nude, tied, gasping, and covered in blood. She was on the verge of throwing up. Following that, he placed her on the bed and turned off the video camera. He then unlocked the door to the bedroom and opened it. Anita had been waiting for his call for a few minutes while sitting outside in her car, and she entered the room within a few seconds. All right, Anita, I've brought you a portion of him. The appearance of his face is not very appealing at the moment. His most recent WH asterisk asterisk E, Lynn, who will soon be my ex-wife, is presented here. Would you like to say something to her? While Lynn was sitting on the bed, Anita approached her and gave her a hard smack across the left cheek. This helped to level out the red marks that were on her face. You are a woman of such a stupidity. Would you be surprised to learn how many times I would have traded you for your man if I had the opportunity? All that was required of you was to make a request. From what I have gathered about him, he is basically flawless, especially when compared to the garbage that is lying on the floor. How much of a moron you are. How are we going to proceed with him at this point, Anita? To see how long it takes her to locate another friend, I'm thinking about throwing this one out the door without any clothes on and throwing it out the window. Do you understand, buddy? To be honest, I am relieved that you preserved his tool for me. I have a brand new hunting knife that is really sharp. The big old tool that he uses is something that Lynn absolutely adores, so we could cut it off and give it to her. Additionally, you are able to store his balls in the vault in order to ensure the safety of the women in this town. In point of fact, I am going to put my prenuptial agreement to the test, that will put his balls in a ringer. In the event that I discover him cheating, he will receive nothing, and boy, have we discovered him. First, we will take him to the hospital, and then we will explain what took transpired. I found him in the garage, where a heavy metal box had fallen and hit him in the face. He will not contest the statement since he is aware that I can cut him off without charging him a dollar if he cooperates. It's possible that I'll give him a few crumbs. What is left for you to cope with is that. Do you have any suggestions? Her father is the only man in the world that she truly cares about, this woman said. She considers him to be her alpha dog. Although I do not have any evidence to support my hypothesis, I can't help but wonder if there wasn't a little bit more to that narrative when she was growing up. But in the event that this divorce becomes a mess, her father will disinherit her, just like he did with her sister. He is unable to tolerate the dishonor that would be brought upon his name, by doing so, he will destroy a fairly considerable legacy and ruin her life. Despite the fact that even after the divorce, she won't be able to get very far with half of what I have, I will still have a couple of intriguing DVDs to share with her if I feel like watching them. It's possible that this will help her control her spiteful side. I'm going to give her permission to get dressed, then I'm going to take her car and go find a place where she can go to cry for a while and cuddle up. 
Don't use the ATM or credit cards, Lynn, you won't be successful. They won't be able to help you out. You probably have a few bucks in your purse, and here's another quarter for a two-bit. Paul remained friends with Anita, but mostly at a distance. Sometimes they call on each other when they're feeling low. Neither wants to jump into another relationship, having been burned so badly. One thing that really hurt Paul in the whole affair was his rough treatment of Lynn. That was not the real Paul. He had struck her twice. He likened it to war, where good men are capable of real cruelty, but he swore he would never be in that position again. On the other hand, he never gave a second thought to destroying Buddy's face. Anita's insurance covered the cost of basic facial repairs, but she did not pay for extensive reconstructive surgery after she released Buddy from her custody with a little more money than the prenuptial agreement required. Buddy had a difficult time attracting women, and his depression worsened over the subsequent few months. Eventually, he disappeared from public view. Lynn took the offered settlement, which was reasonable. She begged her sister for help and moved in with her. She is still trying to figure out how she could have calculated so wrong. She gets ill every time she sees nature shows about predators and prey. She cringes when she hears the terms alpha dog or pecking order. Sometimes she has nightmares about what happened at night with Buddy and Paul. Sometimes she really misses Paul, he doesn't miss her at all. Please leave your feedback in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. In the meanwhile, thank you for listening.